So we're here in London with Judge Marilyn Mornington. You had a very active career. In fact, you're actually a district judge in the United Kingdom, and which is, is quite a significant position, legal position, because you have a lot of judges uh, under you. But before we just get into a conversation, uh, I'd appreciate it. One, you've only recently converted to Islam, so maybe you could just tell us a little bit about that. I've been specializing in crime against women, violence against women and child abuse now for some 10 to 12 years on a policy level for uh, the United Kingdom. And I became, by no choice of my own, uh, because of the work I was doing, uh, closely involved with violence against women in the Muslim communities in this country. And in order to understand better where they were coming from, began to read about Islam, began to read the Quran, and to mix with Muslims. Um, I would have to say, I don't think I really ever had any choice in the matter, that um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had his eyes on me, and, and that was it from that moment on. Without any choice of mine, I kept on meeting one person after the other who led me down a path where there really was no turning back from because the more I got to knew, know about Islam and about the Prophet, peace be upon him, it became obvious to me that this is what I want, where I wanted to belong and it was what I wanted to believe. And I always felt very comfortable with the, the family life and the stories of the the wives of the prophet and the companions and it was just somewhere that over a period of time and I would have to say Sheikh Hamza from your own um, writings and, and your tapes that I was listening to um, I, I realized this was obviously the life for me. So uh, in terms of I mean obviously you've dealt a lot with the Muslim issues and I think we're all curious you know how bad is the situation given that you've been involved in Muslim uh, women's issues in particular but what what type of things did have you come across just in your legal practice what we are seeing every day um, both in my day-to-day -day practice and also on the committees that I'm have to, having to deal with things is our issues of forced marriage um, where people just do not understand the difference between their cultural practices, particularly those of which we have almost two million in this country from the South Asian continent, um, that these practices are not Islamic, they are cultural, and part of my work is to point that out. Arising from forced marriage, we have honor-based violence. Um, girls who are killed because they are trying to breach those cultural practices, either trying to run away from forced marriage or being within a forced marriage, which has led to violence, trying to escape it. We have huge problems, one would have to say, in the United Kingdom of um, people being married to their first cousins against their wishes, tied in with the value of the British passport rather than, than anything else. So bringing people from back home? For Still, it's the first time we've ever had a wave of immigrants when 80% um, are still marrying from back home. That has very large socio-economic and educational difficulties because the community here, because they're continuing to marry, mostly if we're talking about the Pakistani community from Mirpur, which I have visited, which is a very particularly poor part of Pakistan, where the current rates of literacy are only 3% for women and 35% for men. So if you're continuing to bring in spouses with that lack of education, it has big impacts on um, the community here and their advancement and they're continuing to fail in that and I think if you look to why young men in particular are turning to crime and drugs or perhaps to, to terrorism I think a lot of it lies in that in the root there and there are real difficulties in the family lives. Well another thing that's that's interesting is you've actually gone for the British government you've you've gone to overseas you've been to Pakistan yes. and looked at women's issues there and also now recently just recently Saudi Arabia how was that experience was that the first time you'd visited Muslim countries and yes before I went to Pakistan where I've been working for several years now and I probably go about twice a year I hadn't visited uh, a Muslim country I've also been recently to Turkey as part of my government work 
and of course each experience is completely different and the women in each of the countries although they are all very strong and um, amazing women are very different in, in their world that they live in. In Saudi Arabia which I've just returned from a few weeks ago a most amazing experience to see such highly educated um, serene beautiful women who fully um, contribute to Saudi Arabian life both in terms of the businesses they run the work they do in hospitals and the amazing charitable work they do again we're able to come back here and break down the preconceptions and hopefully move forward together as a result of the trip the British Foreign Office are looking to bring a delegation of Saudi women over here particularly to look at advancing together um, issues over violence you were particularly looking at issues over violence in Saudi women's Arabia? Viol yeah, well, I, we looked at all aspects of women's life in Saudi Arabia, but my particular interest was looking at issues uh, of how they're, they're tackling and beginning to tackle issues of violence against women and children. I was very lucky to have a meeting with a Sharia judge. Um, I think he was terrified meeting me. But, uh, really? That's was an interesting in experience. He was very good to meet me and has kindly invited me to come back and actually see the courts in action. That's wonderful. But also I met doctors there and they're setting up a nationwide network in Saudi Arabia of specialists, pediatricians and psychologists. To report abuse. Yes, so that there'll be a special teams of doctors throughout Saudi Arabia who will identify or themselves or have cases referred to them. We'll be learn the specialist things that are needed by the courts and are working in conjunction with the Sharia courts to start addressing these matters. And I can tell you that the Sharia, Sharia judge I met put me in no doubt whatsoever of how seriously he and his brothers are intending to take this matter. I'm hoping in the future that they'll have female judges. Yes, for that, are, maybe. Yes. yes, I think so. <laughs> Next year they're going to have the first female law students, so that's, that's right. the start. What is your perception of Muslim women? Very much influenced by religion and um, probably not as free as a Western w woman would be to basically work dress the way she wants and speak the way she wants. They can have a hard life, um, uh, you know, so sometimes they face quite a lot of difficulties and they are discriminated. But my personal, you know, attitude is I just consider them exactly like me. Um, I don't really have a perception. I don't know any Muslim women to form an opinion, really. In the UK, I think that they probably have a lot more freedom than anywhere else in the world. I actually live out in Singapore, so uh, there's a lot of Muslim women there. And I think that they, there are some times when they do have a lot of freedom, but there's a lot of times in certain countries where they're very repressed. So it really changes on where you are in the world. I guess quite repressed, or at least that's how it seems in general. Like when you walk around, they're always kind of, I mean, I don't really know. Well, as a judge, how were you perceived as, as a Muslim woman in the UK um, to maybe your colleagues and things like that when you first became a Muslim? When was it really that you became Muslim? Just before Ramadan last year. Um, I don't at the present time make a big issue of it. I recall that one of the best Christians that I know is a high court judge in England. Um, he never talked about it, his Christianity, he just showed it by his way of life. And eventually you would say, what is it about Mark Headley that is so wonderful? And some people, didn't you know he's a very active Christian? I'm, I'm not very wonderful, but and I'm also a very, very much a learner in Islam, so I think it's important that I keep a relatively low profile, um, you carry have, on learning. You have, um, because your responsibility, you have an entire district. How do you rate the, uh, the domestic violence? Is, is there more domestic violence in the Muslim community, or is it consistent with the national average or less? We don't have statistics, but from all the work I've done, we have no reason to think that it's any greater within the Muslim community than within the dominant community. The difficulty is that there are certain barriers that women have, or men who are suffering this violence, to get over mm. matters of uh, racism against them, language difficulties, right. immigration issues, uh, matters of izat, of feeling that they're shaming their family if they come forward, right. lack of facilities for them. I mean, I was only talking yesterday um, to a very active Muslim woman in Wales, Shaheen Taj, of how we need to set up a nationwide um, group of Muslim female counsellors that women can go to because if women feel that they go forward and the people that they'll speak to don't understand and, uh, where they're coming from, and, they're not going to come forward. And they also I think often uh, assume because it's a Muslim woman 
you know, she's oppressed because of her being a Muslim woman. They tend to, people tend to not be able to, to see it as a, this is a human problem. They really begin, just because of the mere fact it's a Muslim woman, there's an automatic assumption that it's related to the religion, which is a real problem. They, 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 we seem to have an inability to really see ourselves. I didn't want to take my very smart hijab and a buyer off when I came back from Saudi Arabia <laughs> last week. I'd spent a lot of money on it. It was very nice. Very smart, isn't very it? Very smart. Some with of them the, are beautiful. With the huh? sleeves. Yes. And, so, and also, <laughs> partly because I didn't want to take it off, but secondly, as an experiment, I kept it all on going through Heathrow and Manchester Airport just to see what the reaction would be to me. And it only took minutes in Manchester Airport for a man to be very rude to me. Really? Which never happened before. Which never happened which before. Would never, it's never no, happened exactly. before. What and did people do? don't realize Get it. Get out of the way, you. You, he okay. said to me. My, uh, my wife, we were at a grocery store, and uh, there was a, a Mexican girl was doing the thing. And the boy was up on the... She had the baby up on thing because she was getting the things, and and the and the the girl said in Spanish to the other girl, just knock him over, and my wife just looked at her and she said, I, I speak Spanish, you know, because my wife's Mexican, <laughs> but she had a hijab. She she just assumed she was Arab, you know, and and people have no, it's ignorance. Do you know what fascinates me? Sheikh Hans and I both come from Roman Catholic backgrounds, and nuns the world world over who were identical clothes yes. to the Kuwaiti yeah. women. Right? They look like Kuwaiti women. Because right. you know the Kuwaiti the, the women wear the white mm. and the, with the black over it. Right. And regardless of anybody's religion, people have this very... Veneration. Yeah, positive view of nuns. If they see nuns in an airport, they'll smile at them. Look, there's some nuns. Isn't this nice? You know. They feel more comfortable now, sometimes. Psychologically, <laughs> I want to know the difference. Yeah. yeah. Why are they it not the, the image? I think this. Yeah. But how do you feel about that? Do you think this somehow we'll start changing this whole image and this... Not to the present time. No. no because no, with, the riot, with, with the Islamophobia, yeah, with the Islamophobia. whole terrorist threat, and the communities aren't helping themselves either in no, that. No, this That's is the real problem. Yeah, I dislike this word, Islamophobia, but you know, it's, it's true. Is that, is that the case in the UK? Is there like a huge Islamophobia? Huge. Huge. It's growing on me. Yes. I, I didn't like the word before, really? but I'm yeah. kind of getting used to it now. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I was interested to ask, I mean, you were talking about how you gradually started to learn about Islamic law and Islamic Sharia. I'm just wondering, how does that fit with your work? Because you're, does that create some sort of conflict? Or well, Sharia judge asked me this question. Oh, really? <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> Very interesting. When I, we had a delegation of our most senior judges out to Pakistan recently because we've signed bilateral agreements with them about returning children and matters of this sort. And before they arrived, the Sharia judges in Pakistan read our Children's Act. And when they arrived, they said, there is nothing in your law that contradicts anything Isn't in that Sharia amazing? law. Yeah. There is no difficulties it, well, about that whatsoever. It's one of the things I think a lot of people don't realize. You know, people that have studied Western law and uh, Islamic law, just so much of law is rooted in common sense. It's rooted in, in very rational principles. I mean, the majority of Islamic law. In fact, I think a lot of Western people, when they study Islamic uh, marital laws, are actually shocked at how progressive a lot of the laws are. I mean, I, that's more... You're smiling. That means I you've have, studied it? I, I have been studying it. Yeah, I um, see the smile. Yeah. I've recently spoken to a, a female professor of Sharia law at Lahore University and a female professor of law, Professor Ali, at Warwick University here, who was um, Minister for Women's Development in Pakistan, but she's an English professor of law. They both tell me within three weeks the same story, that when they lecture on Sharia family law, particularly the rights that women have, the demands they can make for their nikah contract, the male students all say, you're making this up. No, they, they don't believe this. it. This is the male Muslim students. Yeah. You're making this up. You're only saying this to they please the girls. Yeah. Would you prefer to have somebody that decided to marry another woman um, as a husband, you decided to marry another woman, or would you rather have somebody that is just married to you, but perhaps has extramarital affairs that you don't know about? I'd rather someone was married to me and stayed with me and have no extramarital affairs. Ooh, that is a hard question. <sighs> I oh. never thought about that. No, <laughs> never. Well, you mean cheating or actually knowing about it? Well, if I found out that I was with somebody that was cheating, I just wouldn't be with them. Um, and I think it's totally wrong. I can't see why they should have four wives. Why? You know, 
to me, marriage is like love and trust and, you know, all that. What do you think about polygamy just in well, general? I mean, as long as women are happy to be, like, in a, this kind of relations, I think it's fine. But if they kind of want just, like, one man, and uh, then I think it's wrong. And I think if men can do that, that women can do that as well. So one woman can have, like, few guys. But, so, I don't know. Well, I wanted to ask you, when we were, you know, talking about legal systems, we spoke about other countries that maybe didn't allow the, the woman to come forth for her rights because she was scared in some way that she may have other rights taken away from her. Look at legal systems throughout the world, and yeah. really, it isn't a question of the laws you have. Yes, yeah, true. It's a question of whether men or women right. feel able to access that, those that, courts. You know, the courts so amazing, have to be. Yeah. And when I'm the really judge asked me that. last week, yeah. when he said to me about the value of women judges, I said, you know, it's not when women when women are judges in a system, it's not the fact that you may appear before a women judge, but if there are women judges, women feel more comfortable with that system generally because they feel it's going to be more women friendly if that's the case. But it may be a case in certain um, countries that women will only want to go to other women judges because they will feel comfortable with that. Reconciliation, I mean, in conflict theory, it's the most difficult thing is getting the one side to see the other person's side and the other person to see the other. You have to be able to get outside of yourself which is really a difficult thing to do. Because that's a strong word, the shuh, you know. Yeah, shuh is what one yuqa shuh nafsi. We, we've recognized, and going to law is the failure. If anybody gets to me, that's it. there's I, been a failure. Yes. And we've recognized this. If anybody this gets to you, sorry, yeah, I didn't if get you that. actually have to yeah. get to me as well, a family law judge, with you oh, failed. I see. Yeah, and right. I actually regard any case that actually fights in front of me as a failure. Because at every stage, even if it gets to me as the court, I will do everything I can to get that couple to negotiate and to, to settle right. either on their own or with help from advisors. And we've now made this the central tenant of our whole family law system, whether it's about money or divorce or the children, that we do everything to help that couple and that family to at least come to an agreement. If they can't be reconciled as a family, to, to come to agreements about those issues. Now, I think what we very much need while we're developing that is that we need a system, certainly throughout the United Kingdom, that Muslim families have got somewhere safe and appropriate and neutral and they can do that, that they can go to where it, so that they don't so law should be the last resort it's surgery yeah but, so, did you, but we um, don't have that and I'm hoping the Jewish community does have it though, they though. have a wonderful system yeah. I was going to ask you feel full rights yeah. there they feel safe yeah. to go there and they use their halakha law they use it for contracts they use it any disputes yeah. in the I mean that's the beauty the of we, status. we have the same yeah. thing in the US that you can actually yeah. set up yeah. Um, they're, they're like people's courts where, where people sign an agreement and then it becomes legally binding. Yes. They have to take the, the arbitrator's uh, decision. But throughout this country we have um, women who are trained lawyers often because of hijab and not working because they have difficulty getting into firms oh, really? who, could, who could take part in this process. Yeah. Why I mean, aren't they working? Just well, discrimination. And we've seen that, what's interesting is we've seen that in every country we've been to. Yeah. We've had women complain to us that they can't get jobs wearing the hijab. And I met a woman in one of the Arab countries. I could tell she was a devout woman just from her face. And, um, and, I, and so I was surprised she didn't have hijab on. And then as, as we were leaving, um, she said to me, I'm really thinking about quitting this job. And I said, why? And she says, because right when I get to the, the door, I take off my hijab. And when I finish my job, when I, right when I get to the door, I put it back on um, because they won't allow me to wear the hijab. And, and, you know, this is what I was trained in. And in this field in our country, you can't get a job wearing the hijab. And I, it was so, I was so distressed to hear that. You know, what humiliation in, to be in a Muslim country. I mean, it's one thing in the UK where people are just unaccustomed to this, but to be in a Muslim country, where, where you can't wear a hijab. I've gone through a real issue with girls who've said this to me. I mean, should I say to them? Because in England, once you had the job, they could never sack you. Mm. And in fact, once you had the job and you wore your hijab, people would get used to it within a week or so, and that would be the end of it. So therefore, should I advise these girls, highly qualified girls who can't get jobs because of it? And they can never prove of that, because there are 200 applicants for every job anyway. 
take it off for the interview and put it back on next week when you've got the job. Now that's a real moral dilemma that's for because very do we yeah. need those women in those positions, in those firms, and once they're there yeah. and See, they're that, that's called a Nazila. I mean, that is a Nazila, and that's where you would really need somebody like uh, Sheikh Ali Juma or Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya, somebody at that level that could really uh, be able to take that. I mean, I wouldn't want the responsibility of saying, I could have an opinion, but well, what, I don't want the responsibility you, of... We need to put you through to Sheikh Ali Juma. Well, no. We met him in Egypt. He's yeah. wonderful, yeah. Um, I, Again, uh, Judge Marilyn, it's always um, wonderful to see you, and uh, I, I'm really happy with, you know, I, f I actually feel just very honored to have people like you coming into Islam and honoring the community. The Prophet ﷺ made a dua about Sayyidina Omar, Allahumma Azzar Islam bi Hadar Omarain. You know, make Islam strong with one of the Omars. And, and it was Omar ibn al-Khattab that Allah chose to answer that prayer. But it, it's one of the things that strengthens Islam. We're strengthened by Islam, but it's also Islam is strengthened by strong people. So it's really good to have such a, a strong, like Bodhisattva, you know, we were going to do this by the statue of Bodhisattva, <laughs> the, the great Celtic female warrior that fought the Romans. So, um, you know, May, well, you, may you be a Bodhisattva uh, of Islam, inshallah. Well, and, uh, Sheikh Hamza, I owe so much to you, and I only hope, as was one of your students, I can in any way, even 1%, um, repay what, what you have given to me. Thank you. Well, it's been a thank pleasure. you so much, really. What immediately comes to mind when you see someone like us walking down the street? That you're following your faith. Do you think um, oppression enters your mind at all? No. A lot of um, Muslim women who I've met have actually been quite free. Um, they've, but, they, but that is, I mean, that's because I haven't traveled to any Muslim countries. I've actually been meeting people here. I think it must be great that actually possibly maybe someone judges you on what's going on in your head. What do you guys think about polygamy? This is where the man has four wives. <laughs> yes, exactly. yeah. I think as a woman, I think it's a little bit like, well, why should the man have all the fun? But then I guess a lot of people seem to get kind of a bit sort of bored with their partner. So maybe if he's got another interest, then it gets him out your hair. So maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> and I personally wouldn't want a husband to have another four women or three women to share. Yeah. That I personally would not like that at all. Yeah. However, even if a guy cheated on me in this, in our country, I still won't accept that either. But I think that, you know, kind of what should be good for one should be good for the other. I'd Thank rather you. be without than have yeah. anyone cheat on me. Yeah, we had that before. Likewise. How about you? No, likewise. likewise, I wouldn't be with a man that would basically cheat on me or have other wives. I'd be far too jealous. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you Thank so you much. So